Hi guys. So today we're going to be going over acute kidney injury. We're going to be talking about what is this and how do we diagnose it? So the thing about acute kidney injury uh, is that, uh, or when we start talking about kidney disease in general, is that there's acute problems and it's, they're not cute, but they're acute or rapid. Um, and then there's also chronic issues and acute can lead to chronic issues. But right now we're just going to focus on what happens when things are acute or rapid or sudden. Um, and then we'll transition and there'll be other videos about the chronic issues. When we talk about AKI or acute kidney injury, um, this can be, there's like a spectrum of things that can happen. Um, it's, uh, you know, it can be just slight deterioration, like the kidneys are just not functioning just a little bit. They're working mostly well, but just lost a little bit of function or it can have severe impairment. Um, and again, this is acute. So this is a rapid loss of kidney function. Um, there's decreased kidney function, decreased urine output, and they can also have what's called azotemia. And azotemia is an accumulation of waste. In other words, you know, one of my main functions of my kidneys is that they get rid of waste. So azotemia is what happens when the kidneys aren't working. And it can happen in AKI where they're not working, not getting rid of that waste. So where does waste have to go? It has nowhere to go but to hang out in my body. Um, these uh, AKI is reversible, but it can lead to chronic and it also can be deadly. So we're going to um, kind of start breaking down AKI a little bit and a couple things to kind of keep in mind. Keep in mind the kidneys are a very sensitive organ. They, they want things a certain way um, and they want a certain amount of pressure and things like that. And so when those things do not happen, um, that's, there's, uh, there's a variety of causes of AKI, which we're going to get into. When those, uh, those things that the wants and needs of the kidneys don't happen, you know, they pretty much shut down pretty quickly. And the kidneys are one of the first organs to go on strike. Um, so that's why we keep a close eye on kidney function with a lot of different disease processes because it tells us a lot about how the body's doing because if the kidneys are on strike there's something going on somewhere in the body that we might need to pay attention to and so um the next thing we're going to talk about is going to be types of AKI. And I'll talk about what that means here in a second. But, um, you know, the when you're going through this PowerPoint with me, um, just kind of keep in mind that there's three types and then there's three phases of AKI. And a lot of times students get these confused. So try to, you know, get these together as we're going through them and, um, you know, try to differentiate them in your mind about what makes them different. So like I said, we're going to start with types. And when, like I said, there's a variety of causes of AKI. And when we break up the causes of AKI, we actually break them up into types. So it's saying like, where did the problem start? What caused the kidneys to shut down? So there's problems that cause the kidney to shut down that are before the kidney, in the kidney, or after the kidney. Um, and so in each of these has kind of different, um, you know, um, uh, reason why it started. And it just helps to break it down to know where the issue is so we know how to effectively treat this patient. So one of the most common causes of acute kidney injury is what's called pre-renal failure. It means there's a problem that happened before the kidney, so when the blood vessels are in the heart, that led me to not get the flow that I need so the kidneys shut down because like, the kidneys are very pressure driven. They want so much pressure. They are attached to that aorta and they want their good blood flow from that heart. So anything that messes with blood flow from the heart, think decreased cardiac output, think decreased preload, anything like that is going to lead to less blood flow from the heart, which leads to less blood flow to the kidneys and the kidneys are selfish. They want their blood flow. If they don't, they have a great union. They go on strike. They say, we will not work for no pressure. So they stop working. That's what pre-renal failure is. So think of all the possible things this could be. We just did cardiac, you know, your favorite subject. So everything that causes low cardiac output, dehydration, third spacing, shock, um, heart failure, cardiomyopathy, all these things we talked about, all of them can lead to pre-renal failure. Um, the next type of uh, AKI can be intrarenal, which means there's a problem in the kidney itself. So what can happen in the kidney? Well, one of the most common things is what's called ATN or acute tubular necrosis. But there's also uh, what he called other disease processes like uh, what do you call it? Um, other infections, like actual bladder infections. Uh, what do you call it? There's autoimmune diseases like lupus that can affect the kidneys. Um, there is medications and the list of medications that hurt the kidneys is numerous. You guys know a lot of these. Antibiotics, uh, what do you call it? NSAIDs, um, IV contrast, stuff like that. All of those things hurt the kidneys. 
kidney to do direct damage to the kidney tissue, decrease kidney function. And because of that, because they directly hurt the kidneys, they go into what's called intrarenal AKI. So there's problem in the kidneys, intra, you enter the renal. So that's inside the kidneys that's leading to this acute kidney injury. And, um, you know, last but not least, there's what's called post renal, there's an obstruction. So there's either, um, you know, what is after the kidneys, there's the ureters, um, and uh, sorry, ureters, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, yeah, I said it right, never mind. Ureters and um, your ureters can get narrow, they can get strictures, they can get obstructed, they can have stones in them. Um, you can have bladder issues that lead to obstruction. And then you can also have prostate issues or urethra issues, um, anything blocking the kidneys from getting that waste and excreting all that fluid can lead to a backup of the waste of the fluid, which can lead to post renal AKI. So pre renal pressure issues, low cardiac outlook, uh, output, low, uh, low preload. Let me try that again. Uh, let's see. So problems can start at the top. Um, pre-renal, low cardiac output, low preload, low pressure before the kidneys. That's pre-renal AKI. Intrarenal, in the kidneys, the kidneys themselves are hurting, a medication, an infection, an autoimmune disease, a direct trauma to the kidney causes damage. Kidney shut down, intrarenal AKI. Or we can go post. So something after the kidneys got obstructed, got narrow, created um, a backflow of um, pressure up back into the kidneys leading to post renal AKI. So those are your three types or three ways that um, AKI can um, happen. There's a uh, document on my Google Drive that you can check out that kind of has breaks down some possible causes of different types of AKI. And it might be helpful to kind of like start thinking about what would go in each of these categories? What would be the causes? So now let's talk phases. There's three phases. Now the phases are what happened. Once you actually have AKI, this is not saying what caused it, it's saying, you know, what phase are you in? And this is kind of a natural progression. So people that have AKI are gonna go through all these phases. Start in the oligarch phase, then go to the diuretic phase, and then the recovery phase. Um, and you know, sometimes the recovery phase, if it doesn't happen or um, if they never get back to normal, they can you know, go to chronic, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, kidney disease and things like that. But for most people in AKI, they're going to go to oligarch, diuretic, and recovery. So um, these, in their name, they actually tell you what the problem is, like what's going to be happening in this phase. And, you know, you just want to really pay attention to what does this patient look like? What's their problem going to be? And these two are very opposite of each other. We're going to focus on oligarch and diuretic because those are the ones where there's a lot of problems going on and we want to make sure we can best help that patient and help them to that recovery phase. So in the oligarch phase, it's like what the name is, oliguria, means reduced or, you know, uh, very minimal urine. So a reduced urine, um, and then there's retention of fluid and waste. Because what happens if I'm not peeing out urine, if I'm not getting rid of fluid, if I'm not getting rid of waste, where does it have to go? It builds up in my system. Um, and uh, what do you call it? I end up, uh, what do you call it? Uh, holding on to a lot of waste and a lot of fluid. In the opposite end of the spectrum, in the diuretic phase, what happens is the kidneys regain some of their function. They're able to pee, so you're able to get stuff out, but they go a little crazy, and they, they just don't seem to have control to be able to, um, you know, effective, like to the way that they used to normally, like, hey, let me let go of this much waste. Let me go, let go of this much water. It's just letting go of everything. It's like a free-for-all. So lots and lots of diuresis, lots of pee, lots of fluid loss. So you're kind of starting to see what the issues might be here. So let's look at these a little deeper. Um, so in the oliguric phase, so remember oliguria is less urine output. They could be all the way to the point where they're almost making no urine in this phase. It's gonna be less than 400 milliliters per day. And it usually lasts about 10 days to two weeks. The longer this phase lasts, the better chance, uh, the worse chance, I was gonna say the better chance of a worse outcome, but that doesn't sound too good. So um, the higher chance that you're not gonna have a good outcome. Um, so this patient, they're going to have low urine output. They're gonna have what's called increased urine osmolality. That's how concentrated their urine is. So in other words, um, their urine is going to be, have a lot of particles in it, not a lot of fluid. Um, so it's gonna be mostly just a bunch of particles. And so we'll talk more about that when we go into SIADH and DI and endocrine, um, it'll make a lot more sense. They're also gonna have what are called casts in their urine. And casts are breakdown of kidney tissue themselves that they're letting go of because there's injury to the tissue that it's literally dying off and it's um, getting released into the urine. 
this patient is not letting go of waste and not letting go of fluid. So where does the fluid go? They're overloaded. So this patient can be fluid overloaded. They're gonna have normal or low sodium and high potassium. Their electrolytes are all off because their fluid and electrolyte balance are off because everything's being retained. They have normal or low sodium because all of that, um, that electrolyte gets diluted with all that extra fluid that this patient has on board. Um, and then also, uh, what do you call it? Because your kidneys aren't working um, right, sometimes they're letting go of extra sodium because they don't know how to, um, uh, what do you call it? They don't know how to function right now because they're hurting. Um, and then this phase, usually the patient has high potassium because, and remember, if I'm letting go of extra sodium, what am I going to hold on to? I'm going to be holding on to more potassium. So in this phase, patients tend to have a normal or a low sodium, and in exchange, they have that high potassium. Um, they cannot get rid of that potassium. Um, and what do we worry about with potassium? Just rhythmias, death. Ah, so yes, we have to be very, very careful with these patients. Um, and so we want to keep them monitored closely for their EKG for sure. So we also uh, we call, are gonna have obviously elevated kidney function numbers, the BUN and creatinine, and they can have fatigue and neuro changes in this phase. On the opposite end of the spectrum, the patient's doing a little bit better. They get the ability to start being able to urinate again. The problem is they can urinate but they cannot concentrate. So, um, you know, they, um, there's just so much that's getting let go of. Like the, it's like the kidneys forgot, like, you know, how to, um, uh, what's the word? Like how to moderate their activity. It's like they've, they got so excited. They're like, we're free, we can pee again. And they get a little too excited and they start letting go of everything. So they have loads of urine output. They usually have a, a one to three liters or more of um, urines. They're going a ton, lasts usually about one to three weeks. You're gonna see lots of urine output. But with lots, of, with lots of urine output, there's lots of loss of volume. You could have low blood pressure, that low preload we talked about. Um, they can also have low sodium and low potassium as well because they're peeing everything out. Um, they're letting go of everything. Um, so as a whole, we really wanna watch their electrolytes again and again, watch that, do that cardiac monitor. So then let's talk about how we diagnose this in the first place. So of course, first and foremost, we need to look at their kidney function. So we're going to get a chemistry, get a BUN and creatinine. Um, we're also going to get a urinalysis. We want to see what, um, what's in there. Is there any infection or maybe kind of help us to see what the cause might be of this AKI, if there is one. Um, and then we also want to see um, what's in the urine. Is there cast, like um, part of that breakdown of the kidney tissue? What's their urine osmolality and things like that as well? We can get a renal ultrasound to see what the kidneys themselves look like, if they look like they're functioning, how the structure in the tissue looks. And then we can also get a CAT scan as well. The thing to keep in mind, remember one of the things we talked about in intrarenal that affects intrarenal is that dye can actually hurt the inside of the kidneys, can cause intrarenal failure. So if we're going to get a CT scan and we're going to need to use dye, um, we're going to have to um, sometimes pre-medicate them with this stuff that's called mucomist um, that helps to decrease some of that, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, a uh, uh, damage to the kidneys from that medication. And then also we want to hydrate them, make sure that we're getting them enough fluid. Um, so kidney disease is all about getting enough pressure. So um, you're going to hear this like kind of as we progress, this is acute kidney injury. The kid patient's kidneys are probably okay. They're just having a little bit of hurt feelings and they can get better. In this case, we want to be very generous with our fluids. Remember, we just talked about in um, pre-renal acute kidney injury, one of the most common causes is because someone gets dehydrated they don't get enough fluids. So the best thing that we can do to help keep the kidneys nice and healthy is flush them, drink lots of water, IV fluids and stuff like that. So if a patient, in other words, to kind of backtrack for a CT scan, we want to give medications and also encourage fluids and maybe give even IV fluids to help dilute all that um, medicine that might be harmful to the kidneys and help flush it out so that it's not so harmful to the kidneys. All right, that's us getting started on AKI. There'll be other PowerPoints about um, other things related to AKI, like how we're going to treat it, what our priorities and goals are and things like that as well. So I'll catch you next time.